This week on The Gadget Show, I celebrate what's probably the coolest gadget game ever built. Stick around and you will see those lights are flashing. Jason visits one of the world's leading games designers to see just how you create a next generation shoot 'em up. Tom Dunmore tries out some of the latest personal video players and we show you how to create your own weblog. But first, John. Years ago, radios were static pieces of furniture adorning the living room. Families gathered round them for an evening's entertainment, listening to the light programme or declarations of war against Germany. 60 years on and DAB radios are stuck in one place too. DAB, of course, stands for Digital Audio Broadcasting, which offers masses more radio stations than a standard radio, less interference and background noise, and lots more information about the station, the show, or even the song you're listening to. Sounds great, but DAB isn't really any more portable than those cabinets of yesteryear. The battery life is so dreadful, you end up leaving them plugged into the mains. So they're fine if you only want to listen to them in one room, but hopeless if, like me, you like your radio to be portable. Something to carry round from the bathroom, to the kitchen, to the garden, to the living room. It's the main reason why, in spite of the vastly superior choice of stations, I never seem to use my dab radio. Another re another, another, an another reason's reception. It's not that strong where I live and it's badly affected by walls. In some parts of the house I can't pick it up at all. And then there's the sound quality. Dab stations are often broadcast at such low bit rates that they sound noticeably worse than old-fashioned FM radio. Of course, Dab isn't the only way of getting digital radio. Internet radio, wireless streaming from your computer, digital satellite, cable and freeview also offer great choice, but they still share some of Dab's problems. But now there's a new product that could be the answer. It's called the Sky Gnome. And the idea is that it harnesses all the radio receiving abilities of your Skybox in a portable battery-powered receiver. And, should you be moved to do so, you can also use it to listen to the sound from all the TV channels you can receive. If you're one of the 10 million or so Sky users in Britain, you can buy this carton for £70. In it, you'll find not one, but two pyramid-like devices, both of which transmit and receive wirelessly. One plugs into the back of your Skybox using quite a few wires, which will add to the jungle that's probably already collecting there. There's some slightly fiddly connecting and a small amount of menu setting, all well explained in the accompanying leaflet. Look the RS-232 connector of the day, the RS-232 socket. There it is, there's my base station. It'll transmit whatever sounds your skybox is currently receiving to this other device, the radio bit, the one I want to call the gnome, within a 30-metre radius. If I turn the telly down, it can be used to operate computers. there's the sound of a gadget show coming out of the gnome. As well as receiving the signals, this radio bit also allows you to control your skybox remotely using the buttons on the front. You can input channel numbers and, after a bit of thinking, the sound of the channel will turn up. You can also scroll up and down channels and use up to ten presets. On the whole, it has a solid, well-made, chunky feel that's quite satisfying. And the screen shows much the same as the TV screen as you flick through the channels. There's the station name and there's the programme. It's not quite as comprehensive as on some dab stations, but nevertheless, it's useful. Once I'd got it set up, I found I could receive stations and change channels throughout the house, and the range is excellent. In fact, I didn't seem able to get out of range, and the battery life wasn't too bad either. Users of Sky Plus will find they can also use the gnome to receive programmes they've recorded. All well and good then, and a major advance for digital radio. Well, no. The sound quality through the two one-watt speakers is pretty dreadful, and it's much worse on some channels than others. It's OK for listening to the news or football commentary, but rubbish for music, which can distort horribly. And some channels are better than others. Even talking on BBC Radio's 1 and 2, for example, sounds terrible. Creams uh, and lots of black. It was a very sober night. You know, sometimes there's a really wacky one like Sub testing. It, it also, it's infuriatingly temperamental, crashing, freezing, and refusing to change station. For the 
privilege of parking. No, it's not. Why is it not? Joe's in it. Eight. Ah! So that's no good, is it? <sighs> I think the gnome's a great idea, not very well executed. Which is surprising from Sky, who are normally a byword for well-designed, user-friendly technology. Unfortunately, I can't recommend it. Now it's time for another of our guides aimed at helping you get the most out of your gadgets. This week, how to create your own blog. Blogs. More and more people are using them, but what are they? And how do you set one up? A web blog or blog is an online diary that you can update daily for your friends and family to read. So, throw out your paper and pen and follow our guide on how to make your own blog. There are plenty of tools to help you get started. Websites like LiveJournal or WordPress allow you to register for free. Once you register, you can post an entry as often as you like. A good blog host gives you extra features like comment posting so that other gadget freaks can respond to your journal entries. Spam filters to stop people filling your comments box with links to dodgy sites and privacy options in case you'd rather keep some thoughts to yourself. You can personalise your blog using a range of preset templates, changing the style and colour to suit your mood. A picture is worth a thousand words, so why not add some photos to your journal? Many sites give you free space to upload a limited amount of images. This one, Zanga, gives you 200 megabytes. If you want more, you can always upgrade for a fee. If your pictures are already stored elsewhere on the internet, your personal website for instance, you can link them to your blog without having to upload them again by entering their web address. Some websites, like Moblog, allow you to upload pictures and text straight from your mobile. You simply email your photos to your Moblog address and they instantly appear online. If you simply can't wait to get back to your computer to write at the day's exciting events, Blogger.com has the answer. A site owned by Google, Blogger, has set up an audio posting service. You dial the audio Blogger number from any phone and leave a message, which is then automatically posted onto your Blogger journal as an audio file. Charlotte's pregnant. I've not seen her for ages. I'm really excited about it. So, there you have it. Blogging. Much more fun than a paper diary. And with all these ways to record your thoughts, what are you waiting for? Blog on. I've been off on my travels again for the Gadget Show. Where? Well, I'm hoping the big trucks, the yellow traffic lights and this flag may act as some sort of subtle clue. Welcome to small town America, a place called Morrisville in North Carolina. You've never heard of it. I've never heard of it. In fact, some of the people that live here have never heard of it. But it's home to a computer games design company on the bleeding edge of computer gaming. Welcome to the headquarters of Red Storm Entertainment. Red Storm is one of the world's most highly respected games design companies. It was created in 1996 by best-selling techno-thriller writer Tom Clancy to produce spin-off games from his books, exploiting titles such as Rainbow Six and Splinter Cell. The company is now owned by French games computer giant Ubisoft, but the games still bear Clancy's name and seem to have cornered the market in strategy-based, high-tech shoot-'em-ups. But for computer games designers like those at Red Storm, this little machine has changed everything. The awesome power of the Xbox 360 has rewritten the book on computer games design. So we're here to find out exactly what goes into the designing of a next generation title. And that title is the latest in the Ghost Recon series, Advanced Warfighter, which was still in the final stages of development when I visited Red Storm. Now, the first thing to realize about next generation games is that they take an awful lot more of everything to make. More time, more money, more people. The last version of Ghost Recon had about 50 people working on it. This new version has a team of around 300 who've been working on it for two and a half years. As you can imagine, the budget is huge. They won't let us tell you the exact figure, but we're talking Hollywood money. 
So, when you've invested so much in just one product, how do you make sure that you don't end up with a flop? Well, you make sure you get every single detail right. And I mean every single detail. The game is set in Mexico City, and extensive recce's were undertaken to make sure that the Mexico City in the game is as close to the real thing as possible. We decided to do a sort of like a recon mission, and we went to Mexico. Um, a couple of the level designers. We were fully geared up. Well, we weren't fully geared up. No, we, we, we were incognito. Oh. <laughs> uh, so basically, we went down. Uh, we had our camera. We had our photo, uh, our photo apparatus, as we like to call it. Uh, and we went down, and we started taking pictures of all the locations, key locations, and then we convert that into the game and the models of the buildings, etc., and the textures, and we reproduce it identically. Firstly, a map is drawn of the gameplay area and the recce photos are converted into artwork in the style of the game. Then the long, drawn-out process of combining the two begins. Firstly, building a wireframe map of the area using polygons, the basic building blocks of any 3D computer game. Then slowly adding more and more detail, until you end up with what is almost a photorealistic environment. And because of the huge processing power of the 360, the game's designers can do more than ever before to make the atmosphere as realistic as possible. We use multi-core technology. Now it's got three processes, so we're able to really push things much further. Before, it was very much a trade-off between uh, you could do a lot of the things that you can see, but then you'd have to lose a feature and you'd have to exchange things. Now we can still do everything. Well, not everything. There's still a few things we can't do. Uh, but in terms of um, sort of lighting effects, it actually uh, over, takes place over three days. So what happens is that as you play your game, as you're playing through, the light's changing gently and therefore you're going from dusk uh, to, to nighttime to morning, etc., etc. It's also playing with the shadows. You've got 100% real-time soft shadows. Uh, and it, it's just that little detail visually and that quality, especially when you're looking on an HD TV. Of course, once you've created the environment, you've still got to build the characters to run around and shoot things. And the level of attention that goes into the soldiers for this game is quite extraordinary. Each single character is made up of 14,000 polygons, about the same number that made up an entire level on a PS1 game. And endless hours of motion capture have gone into making the movements of the characters as realistic as possible. But it doesn't stop there. When you've got the complicated job of trying to make a soldier in, in a game, which at the end of the day is going to be next generation and high resolution, so there's going to be a lot of detail there, it's very difficult to know where to start, and one of the ways that Red Storm tackled the problem is to get actual guys in real, state-of-the-art, and in this case, futuristic battle gear into a natural environment. They look at how the light falls on their faces, how it glints off their visors, what positions they adopt, the kind of dynamic stances that real soldiers with real weaponry adopt, so that the final result is as realistic as possible. And the combat suit worn by soldiers in Ghost Recon isn't just something created by a bunch of geeky fantasists. It exists in the real world. It's actually the result of a project to create a technology-based combat suit that will, in the future, be used by real American soldiers. And this is me, not a real American soldier, wearing it. I've got some water, have you? I'm knackered. <sighs> the real-life suit has an online computer hidden in the back of the body armour, through which video, audio and data can be constantly relayed to the wearer from a control centre. Built into the helmet are discrete microphones, which pick up the soldier's voice through vibrations in his skull. Noise reduction headphones, which are capable of filtering loud bangs while amplifying distant twig cracks and a head-up display which drops down in front of the soldier's eyes to deliver real-time battle information. This next-generation combat suit is still in development and at the moment is far too expensive to start issuing to thousands of troops, but it's already up and running in the world of next-generation computer games. Tango. After two and a half years of wreckies, running around in soldier outfits, shooting guns, and long, long hours spent in front of computer screens, you end up with a truly awesome-looking next-generation game. That is, apart from the fact that it's probably still full of glitches and problems. And that's where this lot come in. They are the massed ranks of Red Storm's games testers. People actually paid to spend every minute of every day playing computer games. To many of you, it might sound like heaven. 
But what they actually do is play one tiny part of a level over and over again for days on end in every way that you can possibly think of to make sure it's all working perfectly. Here they're checking that the game can cope with multiple characters all descending on one area at the same time. Only after everything has been checked to death is the game deemed ready to play. And finally, you end up with this, an exquisite next generation computer game. But stick around, because it could soon get even better. Later on, I'll be showing you how one next gen console could spell the end for the arcade by making the home gaming experience even more realistic. Next up, our regular look at the latest and coolest gadgets around. This week, PVPs. Here's Tom Dunmore with the critical list. With the success of the video iPod and the Sony PSP, many are predicting this will be the year of video on the go. So, we've rounded up some of the very best portable video players to put them through their paces. Of course, the easiest way to watch video on the move is to use a portable DVD player, like this one from Mustech. But this has its own special feature. It has a built-in digital terrestrial tuner, so you can plug in an aerial and it will automatically search for any TV stations that are available. The trouble is, digital terrestrial TV isn't really designed to be used on the move. Even here in central London we had trouble getting a signal. In the end, we had to stick the aerial up on the roof of the car in order to get anything. Once we did, we could find a few channels, more for TMF, Men and Motors, but none of the big ones. This is the Creative Zen Vision. This is a 30 gigabyte hard drive player with enough capacity to store about 100 hours of video and you'll get about four and a half hours of playback on one charge. What's really impressive is the high resolution display. This is a 640 by 480 pixel LCD that looks absolutely fantastic. It's really, really crisp. But that's not the only great thing about the Creative. It does plenty of other stuff, like it's got an FM radio, a voice recorder, a personal organiser. It'll also display your photos, which you can add using the compact flash card slot at the side. It'll play a huge variety of formats too, pretty much anything you can find on the web. The iRiver U10 is a really unique multifunction device. It comes with this cradle that has built-in speakers and it also has a remote control, which means you can use it like a tiny little television. Then, when you want to go on the move, you simply eject it out and you can put it in your pocket. But what's really different about the U10 is its user interface. It's got this screen that you click the sides of in order to access all the menu features. And it has a lot of features too. It's got an FM radio, voice recording, photos, video, flash animations and flash games. The 2.2 inch screen isn't really big enough for watching long videos, but considering it only has one gigabyte's worth of memory, you're not gonna fit long movies on there anyway. Nonetheless, it's one of those devices that once you've picked it up, you just can't put it down again. Arcos have been making hard drive based portable video players longer than anyone, and it really shows. The AV500 is a fantastic bit of kit. It's got this big four inch screen that's easily large enough for long movie viewing, and it's available in 30 gigabyte or 100 gigabyte versions, so you can spit loads and loads of video on it. You can also hook up a camera and use it as a camcorder. And it's great with music too. It's compatible with the Napster to go music subscription service. But what really sets the Arcos apart from the competition is the fact that it comes with a TV dock. That means you can sit it in your lounge and record direct from the telly. No fiddling about with ripping DVDs, no scouring the web for video content. That's why the Arcos AV500 is undoubtedly my top portable video player. Right, now on The Gadget Show, it's time to pay tribute to probably the coolest game ever invented. Aging rockers amongst you will already know what we're talking about just from the music. In fact, you're probably already on your feet, air guitar in hand, ready to hit the big chord coming up in a moment. 
But just before that chord arrives, let me inform everyone else that this week we're paying tribute to Pinball. After the Fruit Machine, Pinball is the most successful arcade game ever. Each year in America alone, more than $100 million are fed into pinball machines. In the 70 years since they first appeared, more than 12 million have been produced, and making them is still big business. Worldwide sales of pinball machines last year were well over 50 million pounds. Well, dominated by ultra sophisticated video games, shooting a small metal ball around a series of neon obstacles may seem rather simplistic. However, it's that simplicity that makes these machines so hugely attractive. Think about it. All you have to do is fire the ball into play, then try and keep it there for as long as possible with a pair of flippers. And that's it. But with bumpers firing, lights flashing, Counters spinning, buzzers, whirs, bells and sirens going off all over the place. It's like having your own personal fairground to play with. The machine does most of the work, but you look very, very cool. Pinball grew out of a French game called Bagatelle, a game played on a sort of small billiards table where the aim was to knock balls down holes guarded by metal pins sticking up from the playing surface. The first pinball machines from the 1930s worked pretty much on the same principle. You just launch the ball into the playing area and then it would roll back down and bounce around these pins, scoring you points, before it eventually landed in a hole. That's why it's called pinball. Get the ball in 2000, you might even get a drink from the barman. But there were also machines around then that did actually pay out prize money. However, these caused loads of problems with the anti-gambling lobby. They saw them as a game of chance and they campaigned to have them banned. And banned they were in New York City on January the 21st, 1942. Barges loaded up with pinball machines and one-armed bandits sailed out onto the East River, where the machines were unceremoniously pushed over the side. Mayor Fiorelli LaGuardia, the one they named the airport after, even staged a publicity stunt where he personally smashed up a whole pile of machines. The ban was only lifted in 1976, but it's still illegal to play any pinball machines in New York which reward you for high scores, even if it's just by giving you an extra game. Because there was money to be made in pinball, inevitably it led to high levels of cheating. People wanted to knock and change the roll of the ball by tilting the machine. In 1932, a chap called Harry Williams came up with the anti-tilt device, designed to switch the game off if the table was moved or nudged violently. And ever since, the tilt has been a feature of every pinball table. So, how does that anti-tilt device work? Well, it's really simple. If we open up the front of the machine here, inside you can see a plumb bob that acts like a pendulum and it's in a metal ring. So when there's any movement on the machine, the pendulum swings, hits the metal ring, completes the circuit and click, the machine goes off. All modern machines still have a tilt function. But as no modern pinballs pay out money, it's mainly there to discourage players from venting their anger and frustration on a poor defenseless game. The next big milestone in the development of the pinball machine was this, the Humpty Dumpty machine produced by Gottlieb in 1947. This was the first ever pinball machine to have flippers, allowing the player to have some influence over the movement of the ball. OK, there were six of them and they were facing the wrong way. But nonetheless, Humpty Dumpty was an incredible success and from then on, flippers became a feature on all pinball machines. Throughout the 50s and 60s, you'd find a pinball machine in almost every cafe, diner and bar in America and millions more across the rest of the globe. It was cool. It was rock and roll. New machines came out every few weeks, adorned with artwork reflecting the pop culture of the moment. 
Pete Townsend even wrote a rock opera about it. If you're a pinball machine collector, this is the absolute must-have. It's called Fireball and it was created in the early 70s and it was one of the first machines to use multi-ball and the first to have a spinner which would send the ball into lots of different directions. These days you can get pinball simulator computer games to play on pretty much any console. There are even a few free ones on the net. But no matter how clever they are or how good the graphics get, Playing pinball on a TV screen can never recreate the assault on the senses or the physical exertion of playing an actual life-size arcade machine. Oh, you Did I just say that out loud? Ladies and gentlemen, I've just been handed some shocking gadget news. It's my solemn duty to tell you that the video game's arcade is dead. Why? Let me show you. For a long time, arcades were the only thing that made the British seaside worth visiting, while old people paddled in the sewage and families sulked on the sand. Anybody with any brains was ensconced in the kitsch splendour of a seaside arcade. It was the classic environment that offered the immersive experience every gamer wanted. You could tear around in a supercar, run around with a gun, or dance around like a fool. Down at the arcade, the interface was everything. And that's where arcade games had the edge over the home games console. At home, all you got was a joypad. Not that there's anything wrong with these things. I mean, I've been using joypads for years. There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> The first proper joypad was Nintendo's NES controller. This changed gaming forever with its pioneering D-pad. It was the perfect interface for the new breed of 2D platform games and must be considered the granddaddy of joypads. Ow! But God, was it painful! Nintendonitis and Nintendo fingers were occupational hazards for the serious gamer with burnt or blistered thumbs from button bashing and cramp in the palms, ow, from gripping the square controllers too hard. As man has evolved bigger hands and more fingers, so too have joypads evolved, becoming wonderfully sleek, ergonomic pieces of kit. The introduction of the horns design helped prevent gaming injuries by keeping the hands in a more relaxed position. But it's still not the immersive experience of the arcade. Using one of these, still feels several stages removed from the game. You're never going to feel like you're driving a car or controlling an aeroplane or running around with a big gun. And that's why the arcades continued to thrive, despite consoles selling in their millions. But over the years, interfaces like the iconic Zapper, the slightly less than classic interactive fishing rod, and the downright bizarre but fantastic Donkey Kong bongos have all been introduced to the home, gradually eroding the arcade's dominance of the interactive experience. In fact, when I went to Nextfest in Chicago last year, where all the most bleeding-edge gaming technology was on show, I couldn't move for physical game interfaces. A game where you blow into the controller to guide a balloon. This futuristic rocking horse you actually ride through the game space. And of course, the awesome Kick-Ass Kung Fu, where you have to fight the baddies on screen for real. Of course, the next fest was all about prototypes. However, there are a couple of devices right now that are taking gaming to the next level using gestural recognition technology. This quiet revolution has been going on for a while now. Take the game track, for example. These special gloves are connected to 3D controllers, which turn your movements into the character's movements. Allow me to demonstrate. Oh, a nice little bit of chipperage. Oh, I thought I'd made it over the water. Oh, Mulligan, Mulligan. The iToy has almost single-handedly created a new, younger generation of PlayStation users. 
essentially a webcam, it puts your image in the game and lets you control what happens on screen by jumping around like an idiot. There's even a head tracking feature in one game. The iToy locks onto your face and you control the character on a hoverboard by moving your head and your arms. This kind of technology, available now for as little as 30 quid, has taken the novelty away from a trip to the arcade. The only downside is you need a different device for most games. Well, even that is about to change. In the battle between the next-gen consoles, we've already seen the launch of the Xbox 360, and the gadget world's already excited about Sony's PS3. But I reckon it's Nintendo's revolution that might just surprise everyone. OK, it probably won't have the best graphics, and some of its titles won't appeal to the more mature gamer. But neither Sony or Microsoft can offer you anything like Nintendo's new controller. This remote control looking thing is the controller for the Nintendo Revolution, and it's quite simply revolutionary. In fact, it's so revolutionary that Nintendo couldn't even send us one. They sent us this cardboard cutout instead. It's pathetic, isn't it, really? You know, UK's biggest technology show. We get something that looks like it's come out of a cereal packet. I quit. All right, I've got a mortgage, I'm back. What's really exciting about this thing is it's completely wireless and it's covered in ports into which you can plug all kinds of really sexy peripherals, like a mouse thing for playing first-person shooter maps, or a little handle that'll make it into a gun. There's also a whole load of sensors that can detect the position of the controller in 3D space and which way you swing or twist it. It opens up a whole new direction for computer games, quite literally. There'll be a baseball game on launch, and the controller can become your very own motorbike, tennis racket, or best of all, lightsaber. If the new wireless controller is anywhere near as good as it promises, it could be the final nail in the arcade's coffin. But how will it fare against the competition? Only time will tell which machine will win the next generation console war. But while it'll never shift the numbers a Sony or Microsoft console will, Nintendo's revolution could be the surprise success story.